If you've seen any of my videos over the past year, you'll know that I adore the first two Paper Mario games. They were among my first introductions to the JRPG genre, and without them, I can pretty much guarantee that I wouldn't be as into JRPGs and possibly games as a whole as I am now. They really did have a near perfect mix of simple and easy to understand mechanics that had just as much depth as any other landmark JRPG title, with just as much story as I needed to keep me hooked. Add the inherent charm of the Mario universe on top of that and the brilliant use of the storybook aesthetic to tell its stories, and you've got games that I will be going back to for the rest of my life. There's really pretty much nothing else like it. Which is why, when the series changed direction and moved away from everything that made it what it was, it left a much larger hole in the landscape than most games would. I did really enjoy Super Paper Mario for what it was, despite the vast shift in gameplay, because it still had a lot of that charm and desire to expand on what Mario as a franchise could be, but I've never really gotten over the fact that the experiences that truly, in some small way, helped shape me into who I am just weren't around anymore. Now, I don't want to sound like I'm an old man yelling at clouds or anything like that, like, kids today with their fort shoots, they don't know what real games were like. Because honestly, despite the fact that the AAA industry has decided that every other game needs to be some variant of third person cinematic action game, I honestly think there really isn't a better time to be playing games than right now. However, there are things that do get lost in the shuffle, and what those first two Paper Mario games brought to the table was among them for the longest time. But thanks to the indie revolution of the past 10 years or so, there have been plenty of people willing and able to pick up the torch for these franchises that would very likely never see the light of day again otherwise. Shovel Knight was a love letter to all 8-bit platformers, A Hat in Time brought back the 3D platformer Collectathon from the early 2000s, and of course, AM2R was the 2D Metroid game people had been wanting Nintendo to make for nearly 15 years before their own Metroid 2 remake saw the light of day. What's most important though is not just that indie devs can revive ideas thrown away by their creators, it's that with new creators comes new ideas, new ways of thinking about game design, and lots of chances to innovate. Most of the people making these sorts of games are fans of what they're homaging, they likely grew up with these franchises, and are more than willing to create the sort of games that they want to play but no major publisher is going to make. That's exactly what led to the creation of Bug Fables, The Everlasting Sapling, and that's exactly why I was so interested in playing it. Bug Fables seemed like it was going to be exactly what I wanted out of a Paper Mario-like game made by someone who isn't Nintendo. A unique world with a completely unique set of characters and story, a general feel and tone of a light-hearted adventure with some darker spots, mechanics that were immediately familiar, sometimes one-to-one -one with what Paper Mario did, but of course with some noticeable changes that made it far more than a ripoff. And the reviews did seem to imply that this was the case, so I was really excited to get it and play the heck out of it. Around the time it came out, the Paper Mario franchise was effectively dead in my eyes. The last game was Color Splash, Origami King was still over six months away and hadn't even been announced, and I really, really just wanted to play another game like Thousand Year Door. So I just played Thousand Year Door again. Yeah, I don't remember why, whether it's because I was focusing on my videos, or if the events at the start of the new decade made me kind of forget about it, but despite buying Bug Fables pretty close to its launch, loving what I played, and even recommending it to friends, I only played a couple hours of it and never went back. But it's always been in the back of my mind, a little bug in my brain telling me to go back and see what I really missed. Then I had the idea to go through all of the Paper Mario games, and I knew exactly what my plan was going to be. I was going to go through all of them, the ups and the downs, and once that's done, finally return to Bug Fables to see if it truly is the game I had been hoping for all this time. So here we are, a few years after that original idea, and I'm finally ready to tackle Bug Fables. So let's dive deep into the land of Bulgaria and see if it will live up to my admittedly very lofty expectations. Is this truly the Thousand Year Door successor I've been wanting for almost 20 years, or does it go beyond its influences and become something truly new?
before we get going, I just want to talk about the presentation for a bit. I really like how Bug Fables looks, for the most part. It obviously takes a huge influence from the Paper Mario game, specifically the N64 game. It has a lot of the same sensibilities, with 2D sprites representing all of the characters, and the world being built with low polygon environments and flat simple textures, with buildings that fold apart as you enter, etc, etc. Even the area borders still have the same triangular textures, but despite that, it still manages to look fairly unique. Its environments rely on cell shading to give it a flatter, more cartoony look, and all of the characters have thick outlines to make them stand out, as well as just being really well designed. These sprites are super expressive and fun. I love how they were able to design humanoid-style bugs and manage to work all of their unique insect features into their designs. Like the character Leaf, for example. It looks like he's wearing a cloak all the time, but no, he's a moth and those are his wings. It's really cool and I like it a lot. Some people may still think it looks a bit too similar to Paper Mario, especially considering how close it is in gameplay, but honestly, I think it's fine. It looking like this is more than anything going to Get Paper Mario fans interested due to its similarity, and the more eyes on this game, the better in my opinion. The sound design and music are also really great. I think they did a particularly good job with the sound effects. They're not complex in any way, but they fit the game so well and really help to sell the lighthearted, adventure-y feel they're going for. I especially like the sound that is made when an attack hits but does no damage, it's great. The music is fine. Area tracks like Outskirts, Termite Capital are great, and the OST sounds amazing when it's focused on these more synthy tracks. Battle themes like Fight. Theva's Grand Stand are also a ton of fun, but I absolutely hate the synth horn sound they use, specifically on Fight. It's incredibly hard to make any synth horn sound good, trust me on that one, so I don't like blame the composer for it at all, it's a limitation of the instruments more than anything. But when the soundtrack is good, it's very good, and I really enjoyed listening to it. With that stuff out of the way, let's start talking about the actual game. The intro here is very quick and to the point, which I very much appreciate. We get a little intro scene giving some background to the world. We are in the land of Bulgaria, the Ant Kingdom specifically, where an adventuring boom is occurring. A legendary plant known as the Everlasting Sapling is said to exist, and its power is told to give everlasting life. So, the Ant Queen, Elizantha II, has established the Explorers League to encourage bugs from all over the world to gather in Bulgaria and search for the Everlasting Sapling in her stead. Once that small bit of backstory and setup is out of the way, we are introduced to two of our main characters, Kabu, a beetle from the north, and Vi, a young bee from the Bee Kingdom, who both want to join the Explorers League to go out searching for the Everlasting Sapling as well. However, they're both rejected for being solo explorers, as the guild requires bugs to go out in teams. Very conveniently, Kabu overhears Vi complaining about being turned down and suggests they team up. Vi reluctantly agrees and after a tutorial fight, the two new explorers are off on their first major expedition to comb the dangerous snake mouth tunnel for an ancient artifact that could help lead to the sapling. This is a nice little intro that gives us just enough info to get us interested in the world, tell us what the ultimate goal is, and give us a taste at what our main characters are like. Kabu is stern, earnest, and dead set on helping as many people as he can to a fault, 
While Vi is more selfish and petulant, wanting to prove herself to people who doubt her abilities. Chapter 1 here is definitely more of a tutorial section, just about teaching you the basics of playing the game. From general movement and platforming, to how saving works, to combat. It works pretty fine, even if it takes over 30 seconds to tell you that Kabu can do this. I don't really mind though, since it's all done through in-universe dialogue between the characters, and I like when a game can implement its tutorials into the world rather than taking them out of it. But the first chapter is called a dysfunctional trio, and so far we've only got two. Very early on in the Snake Mouth expedition, we meet our third and final party member, Leaf, who's been trapped by a spider. His character is a whole can of worms that we'll have to get into later, but for now, he's a bit more laid back, sarcastic, and aloof than the other two, and addresses himself as us, which is a little weird, but yeah, we'll put a pin in that one. After exploring some more, having Leaf discover the fact that he can use magic for some reason, and reaching the apex of Snake Mouth, they find the artifact they were sent to search for. However, that pesky spider won't let them go easy, and it ends up being the chapter's boss. Eventually, they take it out, and this new team heads back towards the Ant Kingdom to turn in the artifact and get their next task. Of course, that is after they get washed away in a river. I really like this core cast. They're all super different, all have different goals, different ways of approaching any given situation, and despite the fact that they seem like they'd butt heads a lot, and do, they always manage to come together as a team in the end and do what needs to be done. I adore their dynamic. From the very start, these three make exploring Bulgaria and its surrounding kingdoms much more lively. Upon waking up after their swim, Kabu freaks out, worried about the state of his team, Vi freaks out, afraid that the artifact, their claim to fame and fortune, is gone, and Leaf quips sarcastically. This is how they interact most of the time, and it's super charming. Of course, they're not just one-note archetypes, they get far deeper and more interesting as time goes on. And of course, while having a good core cast is the most important aspect, a world isn't really a world if it isn't full of unique peoples and places to flesh it out and make it feel real and lived in. Thankfully, the dev team at Moonsprout Games really put a lot of effort into its entire cast, making even the most throwaway of side characters unique and fun. From the other explorers, like Mathiva and Vasp, who are in a constant rivalry with the main cast, or Jen and Eri, who are really just trying to get by, to the important people of the different kingdoms, like the Bee and Termite Kingdom scientists and royalty, to the simple quest givers, there's a ton of love put into every single one. While they may not all be super deep, they're all unique and the interactions Kabu, Vi, and Leaf have with them are integral in making them bond into a closer knit team. The bond does grow fairly quickly and I feel like a lot of that growth is thanks to how relatively low stakes the first few chapters are. Being an explorer is dangerous work, there's a ton of stuff out there that'll kill you, but aside from the general hazards of the job, the first few chapters are very breezy and lighthearted. There's no major conflicts, political, global, or personal, aside from small hints here and there, and the overall atmosphere is peppy and fun, and there's nary a rumble of a villain. The everlasting sapling is just a myth of course, and the search for the artifacts are really just an excuse for people to go out adventuring in the hopes of giving themselves fame and fortune. And by the time a plot does get going, Team Snakemouth, as they're known after Chapter 1, are a lot closer. That bond is actually shown off in gameplay as well, and it leads us directly into the battle system. Bug Fables is a turn-based RPG, and while yes, it does resemble the Paper Mario system in many, many ways, its influences and ideas are far broader than just those games. When you start out, things are pretty simple, and the game does a decent job of easing you into its mechanics. There's your familiar HP, or health, and TP, or teamwork points, acts as the mana. With just Kabu and Vi at the start, there aren't a ton of options for you to choose from. They both only get one skill, Taunt for Kabu, to make enemies attack him, and Vi gets Earth Tremor. Aside from that, your main commands are to attack, use items, and spy on enemies to find out their stats. But this is fine because you get to learn what their general archetypes are pretty quickly. Kabu is designed to be more of a tank, he can redirect enemies and hit pretty hard, but he can only do so to grounded enemies. Vi has the highest damage output but lowest HP, and she can knock flying enemies down so Kabu can hit them. This ends up being way more strategic and interesting as soon as Leaf joins the party. He, for some reason, has access to ice magic, and this magic can be used to freeze enemies. 
So we've got our tank, our DPS, and our status spreader. They all end up being super useful all of the time, and it's not just thanks to their skills. So I said that Vi can knock enemies out of the air, well Kabu and Leaf's basic attacks both have unique properties that affect enemies as well. Kabu's horn can flip certain enemies over, which usually leads to them having much lower defenses so the others can do damage, and Leaf's ice magic travels underground before striking so it can unearth enemies that have burrowed into the ground. A ton of enemies are designed around these abilities and even react to what you hit them with. For instance, this enemy will burrow underground after you hit it, resulting in a much more powerful attack unless Leaf is able to dig it back up. But what happens if Leaf already attacked another enemy? Do you just have to take the hit? Not necessarily. You can block the damage by pressing a button at the right time, reducing it even further if you time the hit more accurately, but there's something else that you can do here. One of Bug Fable's most interesting additions to this battle system is its turn relay mechanic. With turn relay, you can pass an ally's action onto another, letting them move more than once in a turn. This is typically balanced out by the fact that the ally you move more than once with gets tired and has their attack reduced by one when attacking via a relay. So there's a lot of strategy that can come from this system and how you use it really depends on how you want to play. The strategy even builds beyond that due to your party's placement in battle. You know how in some Final Fantasy games you could have the party members in different rows and that would affect their stats a bit? Well, the same general thing happens here. The party member you have in the front row is super important because that bug gets a plus one to their attack stat. But the trade-off is that the one in front is much more likely to be attacked by enemies. So which one you have in front is a bit of a balancing game. Is it worth having, say, Vi out in front to get the extra damage on her boomerang skills, knowing that she's typically the most frail and most likely to be KO'd if she's targeted a bunch? And it goes even further beyond that, since on top of swapping the team around physically, you can also use each character's turns whenever you want. Obviously, this helps facilitate the turn relay system, but it's just so great on its own for strategy. If you really want to max out your damage numbers, you're going to have to plan out how each turn goes and utilize each party member in just the right way at just the right time, and it's so much fun. You can also give yourself more options in battle by first striking enemies. Unlike Paper Mario, this gives you a second action on the bug that hit the enemy in the field rather than straight up guaranteed damage. I actually kind of like Paper Mario's system a bit more since you could use high FP attacks for free if you did them out in the field, but this way still does work pretty well since you need as much versatility as you can get to deal a ton of damage here. Speaking of the damage numbers, you probably noticed that Bug Fables takes very strongly from the first two Paper Mario Mario games for this as well. Just like those two games, health and damage numbers are very low, which not only makes them easy to understand, losing 3 HP out of a total of 10 is a lot more impactful than losing 2392 out of 7943, but it also makes the design decisions for each battle far more deliberate and meaningful. When a designer knows exactly what health, damage, and resources both the players and enemies have, it's a lot more straightforward to create a really good difficulty balance. They even managed to balance out a hard mode here pretty well. Hard mode increases enemy health and damage output, but gives out more experience and berries as a reward, and on top of that, actively rewards you for defeating bosses in hard mode with medals that you would otherwise have to buy. It's a really cool way to increase the game's difficulty without sacrificing the relatively smooth difficulty curve, and honestly, I think the game's more fun and balanced this way. However, I feel like this balance, especially when it comes to leveling, is a bit more ham-fisted and forced than it was in Paper Mario. Yeah, in those games, stronger enemies gave out more experience than weaker ones, and it tapered off pretty quickly to reduce grinding. But Bug Fables goes to the extremes here and tries its best to force players into a level curve. When you enter a new area, you can regularly gain like 25 plus experience points from a single battle with regular enemies, and it dive bombs to zero really fast once you hit certain levels. I feel like this is a result of the leveling system, which is different from Paper Mario for the sake of being different, basically. It starts at 100 experience per level, which makes sense, but that amount slowly increases over time. This really doesn't improve anything, it doesn't fix a problem or make leveling up more fun, so I don't really understand the purpose of it. Especially with the huge amount of experience given out, I feel like smoothing that out would have been a bit 
more satisfying. It's not like the game balance is significantly affected though, Bug Fable still manages to have a really good difficulty curve just like Paper Mario. The Paper Mario games themselves were never exactly designed to be the hardest games on the planet though, they were basically meant to be an entry point to the genre. The numbers being small was a big part of that, but it also never forced too much of a challenge onto the player. There were tough fights here and there, but they were typically due to more challenging and unique mechanics than any raw numerical difficulty. Bug Fables, on the other hand, isn't designed for the first time player. Yes, it still has a lot of the same design philosophy that made a lot of those earlier games so approachable for new players, but the game is designed for people who already love those games, and it lets the team be far more ruthless when it comes to difficulty. Enemies and bosses hit like freight trains, and it takes a lot of planning and strategy to get through even the most basic of encounters. It's never so hard that I would get stuck on a boss for more than a couple of tries, and I was still able to get through the vast majority of the game with no problem, but yeah, I ended up relying on things like recovery items and skills a lot more than I normally would in most RPGs to be honest. A big part of why this is, is because you have basically no health in this game. Now, you start out with a bit more total HP in Bug Fables, just under 25, but that number doesn't increase a lot even if you want it to. When you level up, you get the familiar choice of HP, TP, or MP metal points, which we'll get into in a bit. However, it's different than it was in Paper Mario. Here you get either 3 HP, 3 TP, or 3 MP. Seems balanced, but it really kind of isn't. The 3 HP you get is spread evenly across each team member, so if you level up HP, you're only getting one more point of damage on any one bug. That ends up feeling super insignificant, especially since there will typically be one bug out in front, taking the majority of the damage. And losing a party member can be far more devastating than it is in most games. So I ended up focusing on keeping everybody healthy with items and making sure enemies didn't have the opportunities to attack, rather than wasting levels on HP that probably won't be worth it. So HP ends up feeling like a dump stat that you only choose if if you have enough TP to do everything you want and have no more metals you need to equip for your build. And yeah, since HP and TP in general is given out much more stingily than in Paper Mario, the focus on building characters with medals, this game's equivalent to badges, is much more important. Medals here work almost exactly like they do in Paper Mario. There's your standard ones like HP and TP up ones, there's attack up medals, there's ones that let you escape battles easier or take out weak enemies in the field without battling, etc, etc. But on top of those and medals that grant characters new skills, bugs Bug Fables adds a ton of medals that have completely unique effects that really affect how battles can play out and even result in some super unique and interesting character builds. My favorite build so far is a great example of how cool some of the metal effects can be. I basically built Vi up as a setup sweeper. I set her up with the hard charge ability which takes 5 HP but powers up her next attack by 3. Then I used a bevy of the game's poison medals, like Eternal Venom so poison won't go away on its own, multiple poison attacker medals to give her even more oomph, reverse toxin so poison actually heals her, and weak stomach so I can manually poison Vi with any healing item. So I'd set up Vi on turn 1 with hard charge, taunt the enemy with Kabu, and protect him with Leaf's bubble shield that he unlocks in chapter 3. On turn 2 I'd use Leaf's empower to add even more power Power, heal up Vi with Kabu, and unload on enemies. This damage gets even more powerful with an upgraded boomerang and her hurricane toss. So in two turns, with probably zero damage taken by the party, I can dish out upwards of 40 damage to a single target, which absolutely melts bosses. This is definitely not the only really great build you can come up with, but this is probably the one that has the most thought put into it from the devs. This kind of brings me to one problem I have with the medals here, which is not so much a fault, rather missed opportunities. Poison is such a well thought out build, but that same thought and energy wasn't really put into the other status effects like sleep and paralysis, and I really wish they had. Like, all sleep gets right now is a metal that reduces damage and increases HP recovery when sleeping, while not letting them get woken up by attacks. That's okay, it's fine, but it isn't nearly as interesting as what you can do with poison. What if there was a badge that extended sleep turns by one and let the sleeping bug use a random skill on a random enemy for half the TP cost while reducing defense while asleep? Call it Sleep Talker or something like that. 
just something else to make it more interesting than it is. Paralysis is similar, all it gets is a metal that makes someone not take any damage while paralyzed, which again is cool, but what if there was a metal that lets the paralyzed team member build up excess turns while paralyzed and lets you use them all as soon as the paralysis wore off? Of course, having the exhaustion play into it so it's not too powerful. Stuff like that would have really put medals over the top for me, but as it is, seeing poison builds and what they can do leaves me wanting for what could have been if the same effort was put into every other status. This may seem like a complaint, but honestly it isn't, not really. This isn't a situation where the system has a lot of potential that isn't being used at all. Bug Fables really does get a ton out of its metal design, and it's because the rest of it is so good that these small emissions and wasted potentials seem to stick out so much more for me. Thankfully, Bug Fables does go above and beyond when it comes to the actual skills you use in battle. I'm not going to go over all of them here, obviously, but there's a few in particular that I want to point out. Chrono Trigger had a system where two or more characters could team up and do special techniques once certain requirements were met. Bug Fables has the same sort of thing, and it's great. There are four team skills that you can learn throughout the game that combine the team's abilities all together. I honestly didn't use these much in battle, there are much more efficient strategies, but I really love how it represents the team growing more comfortable around each other and properly teaming up together to take out their enemies. It's great. And I should probably mention action commands too. The action commands for these skills, as well as all of the other commands you can do in battles, are almost all directly ripped from Paper Mario, but I don't care because Thousand Year Door's action command system was and is incredible and I want more games to use it. Especially since the Paper Mario series proper has all but abandoned anything that isn't just pressing A. So all in all, I absolutely adore the battle system in Bug Fables. It takes what was established in the Paper Mario games and tweaks it just enough to make it its own complete unique thing. Despite looking almost identical in a lot of ways, you have to play it completely differently and it offers its own entire variety of challenges, team building, and strategy. And it's always a ton of fun with the familiar action commands, cool medals, fun enemies, and great bosses. I don't think it's better exactly than what came before it, but it's a completely unique flavor that is a ton of fun and is one of the few battle systems that I will fight regular enemies that I don't need to just for the sake of being able to use the system more. Moving on from that, let's get into the gameplay outside of battle, since it's going to be equally familiar to anyone who knows Paper Mario. It has pretty much all the same movement and puzzle solving abilities that you're used to, like Cooper's Shell, the Yoshi's Speed and Hovering, the ability to destroy obstacles, that sort of thing. But to be completely honest, the way Bug Fables gets it all working is a bit clunky. Since there's only only three characters, all the movement and puzzle solving has to be done with things those three can do. This ends up with each one getting several traversal abilities, and that isn't inherently a problem. What causes some issues is the fact that Bug Fables only uses one button for all of these, so you get some strange situations where you're trying to use Kabu's dash only for him to start digging instead, or trying to fly with Vi instead tossing her boomerang out and jumping straight into a pit. They definitely could have put some of these onto different buttons to eliminate this issue altogether, at least for Vi and Leaf. Kabu's three abilities are also vastly different that it may have been even better for a quick ability toggle, kind of like how you can swap between each character in the overworld. I don't know, it's a small issue, but it has annoyed me quite a few times during my playthroughs. Now the game makes great use of these abilities when it comes to puzzles. I never found the puzzles here to be super challenging, but they're fun and interesting whenever they do come up. Using Vi's boomerang to move platforms about, Leaf's ice magic to freeze and into platforms or weights to press switches, or Kabu's digging ability to reach obstructed areas or hidden secrets is a lot of fun. They get a lot of mileage out of these, especially when you need to mix and match them together to make progress. However, some of the platforming that you have to do with a few of these abilities basically just sucks. Any sort of platforming you have to do with slow characters that have stubby jumps isn't going to be great, and Bug Fables does have quite a bit of it. It's not all terrible, for instance Vi's flight works fine enough, and most of the platforming is is usually pretty simple, but when it gets more complicated or requires a few specific abilities, it gets pretty rough. Especially using Leaf's Ice Platform ability. Every time I had to use it, it was a struggle. Especially if I had to try to build ice platforms up towards the top of the screen. 
it was impossible to see what I was doing and if I was going to take an unplanned swim or not. But aside from that, exploring around is pretty fun. There's a ton of things to find, like crystal berries, this game's equivalent to star pieces, tons of quests to do, a bunch of optional bosses, and other content too. You know Leaf's water platform ability? That's found in a completely optional dungeon that unlocks after chapter 4. You can go through the entire game without it, although you will be unable to get a lot of the hidden goodies if you do. Regardless, it's really a ton of fun to just walk around and explore the world. It's just so jam-packed full of fun things to find that I ended up getting lost in it. Structurally, it is very similar to the first two Paper Mario games. It's a chapter-based game where at the start of each chapter we get our next goal, typically to search for a new MacGuffin, and after traveling to a new area, meeting a bunch of new people, exploring a dungeon or two, and finding said MacGuffin, we then return back to base to get new instructions. Where Bug Fables really sets itself apart in this regard is its world design. It's not necessarily a 100% improvement, but there's a lot of cool things here that makes exploring Bulgaria a lot of fun. Now, at a glance, if you just look at the game area by area, it may not seem that impressive. There's a plains world, a desert world, an autumn world, a forest world, that sort of thing. But what makes these so interesting is the context around them. The lands of Bulgaria isn't like most other fantasy worlds. The whole thing takes place on a micro scale from the perspective of bugs, and when you get context to all of these places, everything changes. The plains and forest? They're a lawn and some thicker grasses in a house's backyard. That desert? It's a child's sandbox behind the house. Seeing that for the first time was so cool. And the way they flesh out each individual kingdom is really great too. The bee kingdom controls places with lots of flowers, like the Golden Settlement. Their hive is only accessible by elevators for bugs that can't fly, and has a lot of pretty advanced technology which lets them automate the production of honey. Each chapter, Team Snakemouth will be sent to a new part of the world where you get lots of opportunities to see all the sights and learn about what the world is like, both through the environmental design and characters, and through lore books that you can collect. And this takes us to another way that Bug Fables differentiates itself from Paper Mario, how it separates chapters and its interconnectivity. Where each of the chapters in the Paper Super Mario games were very insular, almost entirely separate from each other, being connected via the hub world exclusively, Bug Fables designed its world to be even more interconnected. While at first it may seem like each area is separate, you can slowly unlock paths that will directly connect two different parts of the world, ones that you'd have to go in opposite directions from the Ant Kingdom to reach otherwise. To be honest, there are some positives and negatives to this approach. Paper Mario was able to make each chapter its own unique world in a lot of ways. Sure, they were all connected to Toad Town or Rogue Port in some way, so you could still imagine it as one connected world, but they were all able to have a completely separate feel. Twilight Town and the Far Outpost are completely different from each other, offer completely different environments and atmospheres, and that was only possible because they weren't directly connected. Areas in Bug Fables, while many of them are somewhat unique, almost never feel as unique or artistically unfettered as these. However, I still love Bug Fable's approach of a more connected, more cohesive world. It just makes exploring the world so much more rewarding. Heading south from Defiant Root for the first time and finding the gate to Golden Settlement was really cool, if not that important. Similarly, the shortcut from Golden Settlement to the Far Grasslands actually ended up being a pretty big deal and I found it via a side quest. Beyond those shortcuts, there are a bunch of fast travel options that the game gives out over the course of a playthrough, from the ant tunnels you can pay to open up to the ant compass that will automatically take you back to the ant tunnels from wherever you are, and this sketchy bug that can somehow take you to a few specific places that none of the tunnels directly reach. It's super easy to go from any one place to any other, which on top of just making exploration a lot more fun and a lot less time consuming, makes side questing a lot more tolerable as well. How side quests were handled was one of my biggest issues with the Thousand Year Door, despite being a rather small issue all things considered but Bug Fables doesn't have any of that game's problems. You can take on as many quests as you want at any given time, and combo that with how easy it is to go anywhere and do anything makes accepting all of the quests as soon as you can a great idea, since you can very easily just knock out a few while you explore. The side quests have a ton of great rewards, and more importantly, there are a few of them that are basically required to fully flesh out our main trio. And with that, I think we should head back towards the story. Now there's going to be a ton more spoilers here, so if you want to skip, 
especially if you're interested in playing the game, I would recommend skipping to this time around somewhere here, maybe. So yeah, let's get going. So where we left off, Team Snakemouth had just retrieved the first artifact and are on their way to hand it off to the Queen. Upon reaching Ant City, Leaf gets very confused as it looks familiar to him, yet different. This is Ant City, but not the one that he knows. He knows that he explored Snakemouth, but is certain that a lot of time has passed since then as the Queen he knows is Illizant the First, not the Second. But unsure of what's going on, and unable to get any answers out of the Queen, the team heads for the second artifact. Golden Settlement is a pretty fun area, there's some cool mini games here and some fun fights, but after the festival it's time to move on into the hills. It's here where they meet Venus, who is revered as a god in Bulgaria. She holds the second artifact, and after a boss fight, passes it on to Team Snakemouth. Venus sort of joins up with the crew from here on. She only shows up every once in a while, and acts as a way to heal up the party before important sections, as well as being another person to talk to in these areas. She occasionally has some insight as to what's going on, but at this point, she doesn't really have anything to say to Leaf about his situation, aside from the fact that she cannot sense his presence. And that his memories are correct. He did explore Snake Mouth, and a long time has passed since he fell asleep. Chapter 3 takes us through the deserts of Defiant Root and up into the Hive. It turns out that the power source the Bee Kingdom has been using to power their honey factory is, in fact, one of the artifacts the Queen is looking for, and the bees have agreed to give it to them if they supply parts to make a replacement. So that's the job here, at least at the start. Head to the Hive, give some parts, get an artifact. However, as soon as they reach the factory, something goes wrong, and it's up to Team Snakemouth to put a stop to the robotic rampage. Honestly, this this chapter is pretty forgettable, aside from the fact that it opens up Vi's side quest. See, Vi was from the Hive, and left after being told that she wasn't going to be a good explorer. Really, what put her over the edge was being told that by her sister, Joan. Words were said between the two, and Vi left the Hive, initially intending to never return. After Chapter 3, we can visit Joan in the Hive, and after an argument, Vi decided to try to patch things up with her by getting some really rare paint for her art. This is the game's trade sequence, which you can technically do as soon as you get it, if you have gathered 300 berries to pay for the ferry over to the Metal Island, but as I found out in my second playthrough, if you wait even a little bit, you're stuck until Chapter 6 before you can finish it. Anyways, after after doing the trade sequence and getting the paint, Vi brings it back to Joan as a gift. This triggers a heart to heart between the sisters and after they both recognize that they were being stubborn and hurt the other with their words, they forgive each other in a really nice scene where we actually learn that Vi's full name is Violet. Using this paint, Joan finishes a painting she'd been working on and it's really nice. Vi's whole motivation up to this point was to prove people wrong and save up funds to get rich and live the good life, but this quest really shows that she's willing to put her important relationships above all that, and I really like that she grows like this. Finishing this quest actually gives Vi a new skill, a much better healing move than her previous one, showing through gameplay that she's grown more generous. It's great. From there, we move on to Chapter 4. This is where things really start to get rolling. It starts out pretty slow, with a hunt for some parts of a key, which involves some roaming around the desert and infiltrating a thieves' hideout. It's here where Kabu reveals that he's known how to dig underground the whole time, which he never told anyone about beforehand because there'd never be anything important underground before that point. Definitely not. But anyways, after an alright but not great stealth section and finding both parts of the key, Team Snakemouth heads towards the section of the desert that has the stone that fits the keys. However, after a fight against the scorpion, Leaf is seemingly mortally struck. A bunch of tentacles emerge from his body and is only saved by Zasp. No one knows exactly what's going on, at this point all they can do is move forward. After placing the key, a giant sandcastle emerges from the sands. This is where some things start to fall into place for Leaf. This castle is filled with ice magic, and the boss is even an ancient bug husk that has the same abilities as him, so there must be some connection. They find an ancient gem as well as the artifact and slowly head back towards the Ant Kingdom. Or at least they would, but while they were searching for the artifact, the Wasp King invaded and they needed to rush to the Queen's aid, but they stand no chance. Somehow, the Wasp King has gained the power of flame and immediately crushes Team Snakemouth, taking the artifact they just found. Mackie, the Queen's Knight, shows up and forces the King to retreat, 
but the damage is done, the artifact is gone, and the Queen's decree is that Team Snakemouth, along with Mackie, are to infiltrate the Wasp Kingdom to get it back. But before that, we've got some stuff to handle with Leaf. One thing that Venus told him back in Chapter 2 was that of the three people in Leaf's original team that explored Snakemouth, he was the only one that fell, the other two survived. In Ant City, Leaf actually sees the ancestors of one of these explorers, Muse, who was Leaf's wife. This causes a lot of emotions in him, and he can't really bring himself to face them yet, but that gem they got in the Sandcastle holds a ton of answers and is similarly related to Snakemouth. Back in Snakemouth, there's a new area that opened up that we couldn't reach before, but with this gem, that area opens up, and after Leaf learns his water platform ability, we can go about exploring it. It becomes incredibly clear what happened here. This was a roach scientific facility. The roaches were a race of bugs that existed in Bulgaria in the long past and are said to not only have been incredibly advanced in terms of technology, but are also the current guardians of the everlasting sapling. So seeing this facility here is a bit of a shock. In this area we also find a ton of bugs that are zombified, possessed by cordyceps, and are no longer fully conscious. At the end of the area, Leaf realizes something. He was here. He was experimented on in this facility. Before that can sink in, the team is ambushed by a zombie moth who calls Leaf its sibling. So that's who Leaf is. What Leaf is. He is a bunch of cordyceps that was implanted into Leaf's body after he died in Snakemouth all those moons ago. Somehow his memories fused with the cordyceps and that's how Leaf is able to remember who he was and have sentience. Leaf's situation is so complex and so interesting. Not only is the Leaf that we know not the Leaf that he thought he was, but his existence only came into being because the roaches were performing some cruel experiment in order to create their own immortal being outside the influence of the eternal sapling. Leaf having to come to terms with the fact that he isn't who he thought he was, yet still deciding to continue on and accept those memories and meet the people his previous self considered his family is pretty powerful because it'd be very easy for him to reject them as he's not the real Leaf, so who cares? But the connections he's made so far with Kabu and Vi, as well as everyone else, convinces him that those memories are worth holding on to, worth carrying into the future. So Leaf visits his descendants. Obviously his true tale can't be told, but he can still share a meal with people directly related to the ones he cared about so much when he was alive. With Leaf fully back on board and more sure of himself than ever, it's time to head towards the Wasps. The Wasp Kingdom is very heavily guarded, so there's only really one way to get there, through the wild swamplands. This is a dangerous area that is home to a tribe of bugs that don't understand Bugnish, the common language, and have no intention on being friendly to any bugs that wander inside. Early on, the team gets separated with Mackie trapped alone on a ledge, and there's very little time to save him. So Kabu gets mad and gets the ability to break rocks with his head. Now, Kabu has been very openly intent on helping as many people as he can, and we learn why in this chapter. He came from the north, and in order to get into Bulgaria, he had to travel through the swamp. But he didn't come alone. He, along with his teacher and his best friend Bit, were all attempting to enter Bulgaria to become explorers. But something happened to them. Something far more dangerous than the native tribe. They were both eaten by Scoliopede, but through their sacrifice, Kabu was able to make it into Bulgaria. So all this time, he'd been dealing with that loss, the guilt that he was the only one that survived, and had been hyper fixating on helping people, probably to try to atone for his perceived weakness. This causes some problems here though, since rather than attempting to get through the Swamplands alive with the entire crew, he works himself up into exacting revenge on the Scoliopede once and for all. Only once Vi and Leaf have been injured does he realize that his goal only puts more people in harm's way. Eventually, the beast goes down, and after some well-deserved apologies, the team heads into the wasp castle to find the artifact. However, this was actually all just a ploy to get the Ant Kingdom's best fighters out of the way. The artifact was never there, and the Wasp King never truly retreated. When we reach the castle again, things are worse than ever. Everyone has been defeated, and just like last time, the Wasp King easily bests Team Snakemouth. However, this time, things are much worse. 
He takes all of the artifacts and leaves the queen with none. This is bad because the kingdom's primary archaeologist realizes that he must be heading directly for the giant's lair to try to find the sapling, which is why the wasps destroyed all of the other kingdom's boats to try to prevent any from following. At this point, there's only one assumption to be made. The sapling must be real and if the wasp king gets his hands on it, the entire world could be in danger. So, Bulgaria needs help. Left with basically no other options, Queen Elizant decides that it's time to talk with the Termites, a reclusive kingdom just outside of Bulgaria. The team heads through the Forsaken Lands to reach their kingdom, and the Queen pleads their case. After some battles to prove Team Snakemouth's strength, the Termites agree to lend Bulgaria their submarine prototype so they can chase after the Wasp's King. This takes them to Rubber Prison, a prison made of rubber, that acts as the final step before the Giant's Lair. This is a decent enough dungeon on its own, but what makes it truly great is that after the boss, all the important people you've helped throughout the game join you outside the Giant's Lair and aim to chase after the Wasp King with you. It's really great to see, I love when a game rewards you for caring like this. But before they head into parts on known, the Wasp Queen, who had been usurped by the King, gives Team Snakemouth the Flame Brooch, which they can use to protect themselves from the Wasp King's dangerous flame attacks. She also implies that the Wasp King's power originates from his crown, but that doesn't really ever come up at all after this. This is actually a big issue I have with the game's story. The lore here is very deep, but a lot of that isn't injected into the story when it really needs to be. Like, the Wasp King is the game's main villain, but almost all information on him, who he is, why he's doing what he's doing, how he managed to accomplish everything, is either just not explained at all, or is sort of hinted at in throwaway side dialogue by some random people in the postgame. If you want any concrete information on his backstory and desire to hunt for the sapling, you know, the driving force of the game's plot, you need to read a prequel comic that comes with the game's art book. Most players will never know why any of the events in the game had to happen. It makes the last stretch of the game feel unpolished and rushed, like they had all this story to tell, but no way to realistically include it based on how their levels were set up. Thus, just throw it in later. Sure, it makes the game's main villain hugely underwhelming and underdeveloped to where it matters the most, but oh well. This isn't a Dark Souls game where the lore is mostly window dressing, it's hugely important methods and motivations of an integral character being sidelined. While having some hidden information for people to find afterwards is fine, they should have found some way to include most of this into the main game. Despite the story stuff though, this last section has a lot to like about it. The final area in the game is the giant's lair itself. This is a really creepy place. The bugs here are all gross amalgamations of bug parts, very unnatural and very very dangerous. But what's more disturbing is the fact that there's something else here. Something very big and something that very much wants to keep bugs out. Its eyes will scan around the area and drop one of its monstrosities on top of you if you get seen. The atmosphere here is really great. It's super spooky and does a great job of building tension for the final encounters. Once we make it through the giant's lair, we do some small puzzle solving in an old freezer and reach a settlement. A settlement of roaches, to be precise. No one even knew if the roaches were still around, so seeing them all here and having them acknowledge that the everlasting sapling is real is huge. But there's no time to let that sink in. The sapling being real just means that the Wasp King's ambitions are even more dangerous than they already were. Team Snake Mouth makes their way through a burning environment, turning off a stove to make the area traversable, and go confront the Wasp King. To be completely honest, this final fight is a bit anticlimactic. Like, yeah, it's kinda difficult, I died to phase one a few times on hard mode, but just the overall theming, it's not as exciting as it could be. He eats the fruit of the sapling and becomes much more powerful, even using the artifacts as weapons against the party. Like, I know that the stakes are super high, but the arena just isn't that interesting. It's just a place, but there's some green around. I just feel like they could have done some more to make this atmosphere a bit more exciting. Exciting, you know what I mean? It is a pretty cool fight aside from that though. He regenerates health multiple times and has some dangerous attacks, so from a gameplay perspective it is a great fight. Eventually though, he goes down, but he doesn't seem like he wants to give up. But the sapling has other plans. Its power overtakes him, and he turns into a tree. Not a second everlasting sapling or anything like that, just a regular old tree. And with that, the Wasp King's reign of terror and horrible ambitions come to an end, and the land of Bulgaria is no longer under threat. With him gone, the other nations have a chance to finally see peace and develop proper relations again.
again. But more immediately, the roaches don't have anything left to dedicate themselves to, so some of them decide to head back with the bugs to Bulgaria to see the land they left so long ago. And with that, the game ends with a celebration. Team Snakemouth are knighted, and everyone they met comes to the ceremony. There are even people writing songs in their honor. Cool. With this crisis behind them, all bugs can now begin to work towards a better tomorrow and create a new era. But today, they feast. And that was Bug Fables The Eternal Sapling. Yeah, I loved it. Honestly, it did so much right. The only things I could think of that were like, not great is some small platforming bits that were no good and some things that were like, kind of missed opportunities. But honestly, overall as an experience, it was just phenomenal. Now, I don't think I'm going to say that Bug Fables is a replacement for a proper continuation of Paper Mario, like some others would probably claim. It's an excellent addition to that style, but there really is something about Paper Mario in particular that can't be replicated, at least for a nostalgia-driven old man like myself. But for people who are hungry for this style of game, this particular niche of experience, Bug Fables is a truly wonderful addition, and one that I'm going to be going back to a lot in the future future. Nothing else will ever truly be Paper Mario, but if Bug Fables is anything to go by, its soul will continue to live on in the people who love it. And you know what? That's okay. Thank you so much for watching.